Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach. I did a community post review of this absolutely awful Bloodline Daughter of Blade book yesterday. But then I remembered this article with Danny and it explains everything. Before I start, first kill graphic novel, link is in the description. So this book was absolutely awful. It was so much like just boring conversations. There was a lot of sitting conversations. There was a lot of sitting and eating foodsies conversations. The few fight scenes were very rushed and lazy. You could tell that Danny really wanted to get back to stuff like this. I'm going to read you all the dialogue from this scene. I sent this page to a friend and he said it's Autism the Comic. I knew your mom was cooler than my folks. My mom would never let me hunt evil by night. Mine isn't either, technically. She wants me to keep it low profile until she, like, contacts some people? Your mom has contacts? Medically, my family can't even have contacts in our eyes. What's going into Jaden's eyes? Sounds painful. Rebecca, oh, nothing, just explaining yet again why no one in my house will ever get LASIK. Call it my superpower. When they finally reveal Blade, he looks like Morris Day from the time. So then I remember two interviews. One was a short interview with Anna Senti in Marvel Age Annual 4. I did a video focusing on the cover a few days ago. And then there's this shit. Marvel did a promotional interview with writer Danny Lore in December. And this thing goes on forever and ever and ever. It's one of the longest interviews I've seen in years. And it's with Danny Lore, a person whose entire career is based off of her being demographically identical to Vida Ayala, who was the hot diversity hire of 2018. Again, this is not homework, but it's an interview meant to sell a comic book. Marvel interviewer says, mother-daughter relationship at the core of the story really stood out to me. Why was it so important to focus on that? How might that evolve as Brielle discovers more about Saffron's past? And Danny says, so one of the things that I really enjoyed when dealing with Saffron and Brielle is I pulled a lot of inspiration from being, my parents were divorced. My parents were both in my life and they communicated, but I was at my mom's or I was at my dad's, right? So there's a lot of ways in which both behaved as single parents, even though both were very much in my life and also interacting with other people I knew who had single parents. There's a different kind of relationship you end up having, whether it's adversarial whether it's friendship or whether it's a combination of both. So I really wanted that to be crucial, the ways in which they rely on each other. So for me, I wanted to have, and I think we get some of that relationship sometimes, but I'm like, you can always use more of it and kind of play with how secretive and how open you are in those scenarios. True fact, the diner scene is actually inspired by an actual moment that happened with me and my mother, where she asked those exact questions in a chicken place. I was not as braced for it. I had no clue she was going to have that topic. But it's just little moments like that for me that make it the I'm going to support you because I know how much the world can be against us, how much we have to struggle, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to voice concern. Or I'm not going to sugarcoat or hide what may be happening to you, which I think when you have that sort of relationship with the parent that it can appear that way to the outside world as if the parent is in denial. Those were only two paragraphs. The interview is this long. It just keeps going on forever and ever. And she's one of the most boring people I've ever encountered. How is she a writer? So Marvel Age Annual was a promotional book. It was cheap. It would be like half the price of a comic book. I absolutely loved it. Great Art Adams cover. A couple of uh, free short stories to introduce you to the characters. And then they would have... Descriptions of upcoming storylines in all of the Marvel comics. So this is for Daredevil. This art looks to be an unused cover. And the coloring would not have been like this. This is just because they used the black and white art and they put it in this. So that's why the coloring is really sloppy. This is just a few short paragraphs. Before 259, we had the whole Typhoid Mary storyline, which led up to the Kingpin hiring her to destroy Daredevil. That whole storyline culminates in a double-sized issue where Daredevil fights sort of all his past enemies, whether in reality or in a hallucinatory form. It's kind of a judgment day for him. It all takes place during an anti-nuke rally. 
I'm dealing with the idea of superheroes as a deterrent for other types of crime. The same way that a nuclear warhead is supposed to be a deterrent against war. So in a sense, you could see warheads as peacemakers in the same way that superheroes see themselves as peacemakers. Because they have these powers that are bigger than human. And because of this, they keep the rest of humanity in line, supposedly. But that's only if they stay dormant. And these guys don't stay dormant. They're out there fighting all the time. This double-sized issue is really one big fight. Enemy after enemy. But it's got the feeling of a judgment day. He's up there, and this is like the last day before he dies. And they're judging him. He's judged pretty harshly, and he doesn't walk away from it. It's a live by the sword, die by the sword sort of thing. This woman, in a brief but dramatic way, is not only describing the story, but hyping you up for it. So you see a huge difference between a woman hired on merit and retained for sales and a woman hired because she is demographically identical to Vida Ayala. Government name diversity hire. So then she describes some upcoming stories and then finishes up by describing her take on Daredevil. She says, The past stories have dealt a lot with sets of paradoxes within Daredevil. He's layered with, you can call it schizophrenia, you can call it conflict, and I've tried to look at that from a bunch of different angles. Now I'm really going to try to mess around with those contradictions. Do you see the difference, the huge difference? Danny Lore sees Brielle Brooks daughter of Blade, as herself. But the problem is Danny Lore is an extremely boring person who was hired because of things that are out of her control. Her skin color, her sexuality. It just so happens that all those things that she is lined up being fashionable. At the same time, her friend, Vita Ayala, was getting so much work that she couldn't handle it. Weirdly enough, Vita's career has essentially evaporated, but Danny Lore is still working at Marvel. This is like throwing away the bike but keeping the training wheels. Danny is just boring. Just deeply, deeply boring. And weirdly enough, self-centered. If you are as infinitely boring as Danny Lore, why would you be interested in yourself and then think that basing a character on you was a good idea? And you see Anne saying that she's looking at Daredevil from multiple different angles. Which means she isn't looking at Daredevil from the inside out. She isn't Daredevil. She's observing him from the POV of several different characters and learning more about him. This is a very stark contrast. And mind you, at the time that this was written, Anne was younger than Danny is now. And yet when you read the interview with Danny, Danny comes off like a very self-centered middle school kid. There's no maturity, there's no nuance, it's just all me, 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 me. Anyway, I believe I've made my point. First Kill Graphic Novel, link is in the description. Thanks for watching. Bye.